Do you know how when a man is accused of being sexist, he will often point to how much he loves his beautiful wife and daughter? What if I could tell you that both things can be true? A person can genuinely love women, at least some women, and still be sexist. This is enabled by ambivalent sexism. Ambivalent sexism is the topic of today's Political Psych with Abby video. I'm Abby, by the way. Hi. Ambivalent sexism is composed of benevolent sexism and hostile sexism. Benevolent sexism is often abbreviated BS, which is honestly probably my favorite psychology acronym. It is so apt, as you'll see. Hostile sexism is often abbreviated HS. This is far less funny. Benevolent sexism is attitudes towards women, and also arguably other people, but we'll get into that later, that are sexist but don't come from a hatred of women or a belief that they are bad in some way. Benevolent sexism combines with hostile sexism, more obviously sexist negative attitudes towards women, to form ambivalent sexism. An example of hostile sexism would be the belief that, say, women are worse at office work than men. An example of benevolent sexism is the belief that women are better at housework. Someone who thinks this probably doesn't view this as a negative attitude towards women. However, this belief is still sexist, as it might serve, and often does serve, to keep women in their place, since it might, for example, cause an unequal sharing of household chores, which in turn could have knock-on effects for the careers of those involved, or just how much free time they have. Benevolent sexist attitudes also often equate to sort of very conditional love, only to women who conform to very specific roles. It is, in some cases, the carrot to hostile sexism stick. Thing is, while I like carrots as much as the next girl, a carrot is just as much an instrument of control as the stick. I'm not talking here about a nice bowl of carrots easily within reach. What I'm talking about here is a carrot either just out of reach or perpetually on the verge of being taken away. So now that we know what BS is, let's talk about where it comes from, other than the rear end of a bull, that is. It is typically theorized that BS and HS are both rooted in the same three phenomena. Let's go through them one by one now. The first is paternalism. In terms of hostile sexism, this involves viewing women as something other than competent adults and in need of men to be in charge of them. However, it also has the BS component of viewing women as in need of protectors and providers. Now, I want to be perfectly clear here. I am not saying that you can never protect or provide for a woman without being sexist. What is sexist is the idea that women uniquely need this protection and specifically from men. We should all look out for each other, but not because we automatically and often arbitrarily view some people as weak. It is also important to realize how contingent this protection and provision typically is on obedience and conformity. My friend Nicola, who I'm cribbing a lot of this research from, gives a really good microcosm example. Combating this sort of sexism is not about not holding the door for women, it is about holding the door for everyone. If you're doubting this sort of sexism exists, you should know I literally could not find a Google Images result for a woman holding the door for a man. It is also worth mentioning that if women internalize the idea that they are weak and especially in need of protection and that this protection should come specifically from men, that is exceedingly disempowering. The second pillar ambivalent sexism rests on is gender differentiation. Gender differentiation is distinguishing the genders through roles and stereotypes. For hostile sexism, these roles would be demeaned and these stereotypes negative. For benevolent sexism, the stereotypes are seemingly more positive, in that if they weren't stereotypes, they wouldn't be insulting. For an example, saying that someone is caring is a compliment, but saying that women are more caring is a benevolently sexist stereotype. Also, in benevolent sexism, the roles women are prescribed aren't necessarily demeaned, at least overtly. As you might expect, it is harder for women to recognize benevolent sexism, and women tend to endorse benevolent sexism far more than they endorse hostile sexism. Anyway, I should mention that I'm not actually in any way arguing to abolish gender. 
However, I don't really have time in what's probably going to be a pretty long video to talk about exactly how to separate gender from stereotypes and restrictive roles, although I definitely believe it can be done. I'd also like to say that I'm not arguing that there are no patterns of difference between men and women, just that these often very small and not typically universal differences are often grossly exaggerated as a way to prop up patriarchy. This brings me to a fun little story I want to tell you about gender differentiation and ambivalent sexism. So a few years ago, I was working as an intern for a political campaign. Somehow, I got onto the topic of shared parenting with one of my fellow interns. We were both about 20, and neither of us had kids, so this is all pretty theoretical. Anyway, he was saying that men and women would probably never be truly equal in the workplace because women are naturally more nurturing and more involved in raising children. I found this aggravating and vaguely insulting, but it is hardly an uncommon view. I mean, this was a democratic campaign in 2018 and this guy was 20. This isn't exactly the far right fringe that I'm talking about. So let's break down the situation. The idea that women are more caring and better at raising kids is clearly benevolently sexist and built on gender differentiation. Then the idea that women can't be and really ought not to be equal in the workplace is hostile sexism rooted in that same gender differentiation. The thing is, though, because of the benevolent component, this guy doesn't have to conceptualize himself as hating women. In truth, he probably doesn't hate women. But that attitude he holds is still as profoundly limiting to women as many more hateful attitudes. You're probably hankering to know how this conversation was resolved. Well, I kept trying to argue that any biological differences in the role of mother and father would only really apply for the first few months of a child's life, maybe a year or two at the outset. Also, obviously, not all families consist of a woman and a man having their own biological children, although I think I may have neglected to point that out at the time. You see, I'm actually terrible at on-the-spot arguing and debate. That's why I refuse to debate people in the comments. Your debating comments will be ignored. Anyway, back on topic, if you account for the most common biological arguments, fathers can still take on more other responsibilities to lighten the mother's load. I've seen babies. They need a lot more care than just being breastfed. Also, not all mothers breastfeed, which is fine, so that argument isn't exactly bulletproof. Maybe if we actually offered better maternity and also paternity leave, this wouldn't really matter. Like, bosses don't care about exactly whose biology is doing what. They care about who isn't at work. We currently live in a world where mothers are expected to have their work affected much more by parenthood than fathers. That doesn't have to be that way, but both BS and HS will make you believe it does. What I really should tell you is what I should have told my fellow intern which is that my dad actually was my primary caregiver growing up, at least in terms of raw time spent. It always felt perfectly natural to me and the way my parents divided up child rearing and household tasks worked for them. My dad worked from home and had more flexible hours than my mom. He was also allowed to take paternity leave when I was born. This is surprisingly rare and was rare then. I'm not going to say my family growing up was perfect. My parents are extremely divorced now, for one thing. But I will say that having my dad do as much or more parenting and housework as my mom was fine. It made sense for my family and for both my parents as individuals. Both of my parents are quite professionally successful. My mom arguably more so than my dad, and I think a lot of that can be credited to neither of my parents really believing in or abiding by gender roles. Thing is, though, that it's not all individual attitudes that matter. Structures matter too, arguably more. Like how I was saying before about parental leave. I will also say, though, that society around us and its sexist attitudes made things often weirder and sometimes harder for my parents. I should mention that I grew up in a pretty liberal suburb on the East Coast, so if what I'm describing was present there, it's going to be fairly present everywhere. Firstly, I routinely got asked when my mom was picking me up from things, even when those asking had seen my dad pick me up far more frequently than my mom. Even very well-meaning people, people who viewed themselves as feminist, still subconsciously viewed the role of picking a kid up from thing as female. 
And when my dad volunteered to be a room parent when I was in elementary school, I think he was the only male room parent for the whole school. This sort of shit is rife, even in supposedly progressive places like where I grew up. I think that sort of made things harder on my parents and still makes things harder on couples who, as individuals, don't abide by gender roles. This is why I think it is so important to not view the perpetuation of gender roles as something done just by individuals intentionally, but more pervasively by society unintentionally. What I'm arguing for here isn't getting rid of gender, but getting rid of gendered expectations, leaving everyone freer to be their best selves. The third pillar ambivalent sexism rests on is heterosexuality. However, it is not my intention in this video to demonize heterosexuality or heterosexual love. That would be highly hypocritical for one thing. I myself am a straight woman in love with and living with a straight man who edits my scripts, by the way. The specific elements of heterosexuality that bolster sexism are something we can work to eradicate from heterosexual relationships. So, okay, how do we do that? And what are those elements? Well, when it comes to hostile sexism, it is intertwined with heterosexual hostility. Heterosexual hostility is an attempt to control women's sexuality because of beliefs that they can use their sexuality to manipulate men. Lots of this seems to stem from the idea that sex, rather than something mutually desired, is a little treat women give to men. That idea is, if you'll excuse my language, fucked up. Sex in a relationship should occur because both people want to be having it. Hopefully this is not shocking to most people, but straight women do actually desire sex with men. That is kind of definitionally what being a straight woman is. Well, the problem here isn't heterosexuality. It is instead the notion of the woman who does not desire sex, but instead what they can get through sex. I have a vague memory of someone in my high school health class saying not to order the lobster if you don't want to sleep with the guy. I am really, really hoping that that was an example of a bad attitude, but I'm not as sure as I'd like to be. That brings me to a side note, though. I think this sort of hostile sexism ties into the paternalistic, benevolent sexism of men paying for dinner and being expected to pay for dinner. I do actually think that couples should generally split the cost of dates, with maybe a skew if one partner has more disposable income. The idea that men should pay for dates is definitely one of those benevolently sexist things that a lot of women end up supporting. I actually basically always pay when my boyfriend and I go out to dinner, but that's because he buys all of our groceries. Before we were living together, we switched on and off who paid for dinner, but we actually moved in together five months into our relationship because it was that or being separated for possibly forever? Man, was March 2020 intense. Anyway, back on topic. The moral is respect the sexual agency of women and don't treat sex as transactional in relationships. I think it's best to start from the assumption that you and your partner want sex equally and then figure out what disparity there might be based off of yourselves as individuals, not gendered stereotypes. And if there are significant imbalances, that might mean that you aren't with the right person. Or you can make up for the imbalance in other ways if you're comfortable with that. I should also note here that while I've been talking a lot about how sexual relationships shouldn't feel transactional, I am not trying to condemn sex work. I'm only saying that outside of sex work scenarios, sex should not feel like work. Also, arguably the same vilification of female sexual autonomy that can pollute heterosexual romantic relationships also leads to the vilification of sex work and to slut shaming in general. The component of heterosexuality that contributes to BS is called heterosexual intimacy. However, it is important to realize that this term does not encompass all romantic and sexual intimacy between men and women. <laughs> This encompasses the tensions arising from men's perceived need for women and therefore desire to control them. That theme will come up a lot. Sexism is not all about hatred, it is more about control. Traditional approaches to heterosexual intimacy view women primarily as romantic partners for men and treat them as essential to completing men. While I believe it is important to be able to feel complete while single, obviously romantic relationships can be very fulfilling for a lot of people or even make them feel more whole. Of course I think that, otherwise I wouldn't be in one. The issue here isn't the intimacy, but the strict prescribed roles within that intimacy. 
Okay, brief aside here, I actually remembered the male and female symbols on this keychain set as the female symbol on the heart and the male symbol on the key. That would admittedly be a bit crass, but it is the obvious option. Thing is, though, the female key here is penetrating the male heart. Is this an effort to make it less sexual, or is this a keychain for couples who love pegging? God, I really hope my mom is tuned out. I was on the fence about even putting this joke in there, but my friends insisted. Anyway, back on topic. There are, of course, quite a lot of people for whom their ideal partner is not of the opposite gender, and there are also lots of people happier single. Another issue here is that this version of heterosexual intimacy encourages viewing all women in terms of them being potential romantic partners for men. Even women who are happy being the romantic partners of men probably shouldn't be conceptualized that way or conceptualize themselves that way most of the time. I am perfectly happy for my partner to view me in terms of a romantic partner, but I would be less happy for a potential employer to do so. Even with my boyfriend, it would disturb me if all he viewed me as was his romantic partner. The traditional role expectations that often come with heterosexual intimacy are also problematic in that it encourages people to find someone who complements them in specifically gendered terms rather than as a whole person. For example, under this conception of an ideal relationship, a man would believe he should be seeking a more traditionally feminine woman, even if one who is less so would complement him better as a person. Sexual intimacy is also key to bolstering BS, as it encourages men and women to view each other as complementary parts rather than opposing groups. That is one of the reasons why sexism differs from other forms of bigotry. I want to be very clear though, I am not arguing for women to instead see men as the enemy and neither are any of the authors whose work I will use in this video. What I instead intend to argue is that patriarchy and sexism are the enemy and that they are the enemy of everyone, not just women. Okay, so now that we know what BS and HS are, let's talk about how they work to limit women. This section is going to focus primarily on BS and interactions between BS and HS because the ways that hostile sexism on its own limits women are more obvious and widely acknowledged. In addition, benevolent sexism compounds all of these problems because exposure to BS has been shown to decrease engagement in collective action by women. So benevolent sexism does not just limit women, it impedes their ability to challenge these limits. One of the most obvious realms in which ambivalent sexism limits women is the workplace. Basically, benevolent sexism attributes to women low status characteristics that are not valued in male typed positions. These attributes are things like warmth and group solidarity, which aren't bad, but aren't typically valued in the workplace, at least monetarily. And in the workplace, monetarily is the main thing that matters for most people. The thing is, if women try to exhibit or naturally display traits like agency and competence that are perceived as more masculine and are valued higher in the workplace, they risk being punished by hostile sexism, or in less scientific terms, labeled a bitch. This leads to hiring discrimination against women even as compared to similarly leadership-oriented men. In addition, these same structures can lead to hostility towards female leaders, including political leaders, as leadership behavior is not seen as feminine. In addition, there is often backlash to women seen as power-seeking or ambitious, as this can be seen as unfeminine, and violating the feminine virtues of being caring and supportive. I do want to say that I do think leaders should be caring and supportive. The issue here is that women are being held to a higher standard in that regard than men are. Therefore, ambivalent sexism limits women's access to political power in very similar ways to how it limits them career-wise. BS also leads to things in the workplace that seem nice but can hurt women professionally. For example, male managers give female relative to male subordinates more symbolic rewards, such as praise, but this comes at the cost of allocating fewer valued resources, such as promotions and raises. Now, like most women and people in general, I like praise. But also, like most women, and most people in general, I'd like to be paid well. Women are also sometimes assigned to fewer challenging work assignments and receive less critical feedback. This is rooted in the benevolent sexist idea of protecting women. But you know what it really protects them from? 
gaining more power and money. For women who themselves endorse benevolent sexism, they are more likely to put a male partner's career before their own and less likely to seek leadership and high-paying, high-status occupations. Even in women who do not endorse benevolent sexism, exposure to BS can lead women to behave in more prototypically feminine ways than they otherwise would and even to doubt their own abilities. Before I leave this section, though, I want to touch on some critiques of how work works that aren't typically focused on in the psychology literature. For one thing, we should probably talk about why these stereotypically feminine traits are so undervalued in the workplace. You see, femininity is not the problem. That's why I leaned into such a stereotypically feminine aesthetic for this video. For more on this, see the feminist masterpiece Legally Blonde. Anyway, back to work, it's not like caring about people and being a team player are bad things in the workplace or anywhere else. I would argue that these things should be encouraged in everyone, not just women. Honestly, if caring about people is an impediment to doing your job well, you should quit as soon as you can afford to. Also, lots of jobs that involve caring about people and are female dominated are incredibly essential to a functioning society and frequently underpaid. For example, teachers are typically paid far less than those with equivalent education. If those in caring professions were better paid, this would be a better thing for society overall and also help fix the pay gap between men and women. Also, caring-based professions are less likely to be automated than in the near future. So, you know, maybe taking a girly job is key to not getting replaced by a robot. Anyway, what I guess I'm trying to say is that men and women should not be treated differently by their coworkers or bosses, but that doesn't mean everyone should just be treated the way men are currently treated. Workplaces should value empathy and managers should praise employees when they succeed. They just should also pay them well. Also, if women are taking more jobs oriented around helping people and those jobs are worse paid, the question shouldn't be what's wrong with these women? Are they victims of benevolent sexism? There should instead be the questions, why don't men want those jobs more, and why aren't those jobs better paid? Okay, so now we're going to talk about how ambivalent sexism makes the world a more dangerous place for women. I do want to say that we're going to talk about a lot of nasty stuff in this section, not in any real specific or gory detail, but if you don't want to deal with that today, that's totally fine, just skip ahead a bit. There won't really be jokes in this section, but I promise one of the funniest bits of the video comes immediately after. With that, let's get going. Firstly, benevolent sexism can attract women to dangerous scenarios because in men, benevolent sexism and hostile sexism typically correlate and many women are attracted to benevolent sexism, which kind of makes sense because, for instance, someone holding doors for you and acting protective can feel nice. It can be hard to distinguish this from a nice person who cares about you. I think the really important thing to keep in mind, though, is that niceness and even protectiveness should not be gendered. Like, is a guy doing something for you that he wouldn't like you doing for him? That might be sexist. In relationships with men high in both benevolent sexism and hostile sexism, love can be extremely conditional, and these relationships can turn abusive when a woman violates the man's expectations. Even when relationships like this do not cross the line into abuse, they can be extremely controlling and limiting for the women involved. Duran, Moya, and Miguez showed that women respond less negatively to a hypothetical assault committed by a male relationship partner if he is portrayed as a benevolent sexist. This might be because in the scenario, sexual aggression is seen as an indication of attraction to his partner. In addition, people high in BS are typically more accepting of marital rape as they view sex as a duty of a woman owed to a man. In addition, both hostile sexism in general and benevolent sexism in women correlate to endorsing rape myths. Rape myths are attitudes and beliefs that are generally false but widely and persistently held and serve to deny and justify male sexual aggression against women. These myths relate strongly to the idea that women who conform to gender roles will be safe from male aggression. This is, of course, false and relates strongly to slut-shaming and victim-blaming. BS especially encourages negativity towards women who do not adhere to certain roles regarding female sexuality. And benevolent sexism correlates to more victim-blaming in cases where a woman is raped by an acquaintance. 
Tragically, a common response to danger and hostile sexism from men is for women to more strongly endorse benevolent sexism in the false belief that this will keep them safe. This is aptly described as a protection racket. Unfortunately, it does not really offer much in the way of protection while constraining women considerably. While both benevolent sexism and hostile sexism put women in danger, benevolent sexism can also take the form of supposedly protective attitudes towards women that can limit them severely. This includes women high in benevolent sexism being more willing to accept limits placed on them by men if these limits were couched in terms of protection. It is admittedly difficult to find a balance here because in some scenarios women are in more danger than men and some situations are just dangerous for everyone. And wanting to protect those you care about is fine and normal. I think what is important is to not limit women in unnecessary, ineffective, and condescending ways in the name of protecting them. For example, think about telling girls to cover up to protect themselves from unwanted male attention rather than trying to get men to stop being creeps. Side note here, modest clothing does not keep you from getting perved on. The worst sexual harassment of my life happened when I was in jeans and a t-shirt and goddamn Crocs. Did I mention I was 12? In a similar vein, I know a girl who was frequently harassed by adult men while wearing a mandatory school uniform as a child and young teen. Anyway, to return from that example, I don't have a solution here other than to encourage people to view danger in a more rational and less gendered way, and to let women make their own decisions. Also, to encourage people not to engage in victim blaming. Women and all people should be entitled to liberty and autonomy without sacrificing safety. There are definitely some irrational danger perceptions brought on by benevolent sexism, and I'm going to give another pretty clear example of that later. There's loads of research on the danger ambivalent sexism poses to women's safety, but if I covered all of it in this video, the video would be both incomprehensibly long and unbearably grim. Before I move on completely though, I do want to mention that men can also be the victims of assault and abuse and that neither benevolent sexism nor hostile sexism does those men any favors. The strictly gendered worldview of ambivalent sexism has difficulty conceptualizing and dealing with male victims or female perpetrators. The gender roles aspect of ambivalent sexism can also be very limiting. I discussed this before in the section on gender differentiation, so I won't go into too much depth here. Basically, what this is, is the ways in which hostile sexism punishes women who violate gendered expectations, whereas benevolent sexism rewards those who conform, although those rewards are often paltry. This is the carrot and stick I was talking about earlier. You might have guessed by now that some women are going to have an easier time fitting into the mold of the ideal woman than others. However, no matter how caring, cooperative, loving, and beautiful a woman is, that mold is still constraining. Still, with the concepts of benevolent sexism and hostile sexism, it is important to explore the concepts of good women and bad women, acceptably feminine women and women who are not. Benevolent sexism provides men with a way to believe that they don't hate all women, only some women. In fact, benevolent sexism and hostile sexism can be applied to the same woman in different situations, although some women experience far more of one than the other, and we're going to go into some factors that affect that. But first, in order to illustrate this phenomena, I want to read you a passage from the late Christopher Hitchens, which is rife with both benevolent sexism and hostile sexism, and shows the ways in which they both intertwine and separate from each other very clearly. Before I get started, I want to say that one of the things that Christopher Hitchens is known for and that lent him a good deal of credibility is his posh British accent. It can be quite difficult to see when someone with one of these accents is actually full of shit. I can just about manage it after four years at St. Andrews and a two-year relationship with an actual aristocrat. Therefore, I will be reading these quotes in a valley girl voice. I should mention that my boyfriend is British, he's not the aristocrat and has a lovely voice. He's in the next room and would gladly read this section. But Christopher Hitchens does not deserve his voice. This article is called Why Women Aren't Funny. And by the way, it's still up on the site of Vanity Fair because cancel culture may not be real even if you're dead. What is perhaps most interesting is that Hitchens isn't actually claiming no women are funny. He says, 
My argument doesn't say that there are no decent women comedians. There are more terrible female comedians than there are terrible male comedians. I'm not going to touch that to avoid derailing the video. He goes on to say, but there are some impressive ladies out there. Most of them, though, when you come to review the situation, are hefty or, word I really don't think I should say that describes lesbians, or Jewish, or some combo of the three. So what he's saying here is that women in these categories can be funny because they aren't really properly feminine women. It's a pretty good illustration of how women can't win under patriarchy. Can I just say that it's a fucking delight to hear that Christopher Hitchens does not think that women from my whole ethnic group are proper women? At least he thinks we're funny. But he even finds a way to make that insulting, which I'm getting to in a minute. There is, of course, nothing wrong with women being masculine. The problem is Hitchens thinks women can't be feminine and funny, and femininity is both a thing he prizes and thinks he is the arbiter of. Anyway, back to this drag. When Roseanne stands up and tells biker jokes and invites people who don't dig her shtick to suck her dick, you know what I'm saying? And the sapphic faction may have their own reasons for wanting what I want. The sweet surrender of female laughter. This is such a look at me I went to Balliol statement. Also pretty homophobic. Next terrible point. While Jewish humor, boiling as it is with angst and self-deprecation, is almost masculine by definition. Okay, that's just cruel. Existing in a world that makes women constantly undercut themselves... And yet, being funny about that is considered unfeminine? Also, in what world is angst unfeminine? This is also a pretty reductive description of Jewish humor. I do want to say, though, that I don't think this article is the most egregious or important example of sexism ever. Not even close. I chose it because it has stuck in my mind and annoyed me for years after I heard about it from Tina Fey's autobiography. I wanted to go with something a bit lower stakes for some illustrative examples to keep the video from being too grim. I also chose it because it has clear instances where you can see the relationship between benevolent sexism and limiting attitudes towards women. Here's one of those examples. Women, bless their tender hearts, would prefer that life be fair and even sweet rather than the sordid mess it actually is. Jokes about calamitous visits to the doctor or the shrink or the bathroom or the venting of sexual frustration on furry domestic animals are a male province. The idea that women are tender and moral is benevolently sexist, and here leads to the idea that certain types of jokes are not for women, or at least not for proper feminine women, therefore putting limits on women. Also, just side note here, is this last bit talking about bestiality? Were there a lot of jokes about bestiality in 2007, or is this just a really weird example? Okay, moving on from Hitchens, let's talk some more about how the system of ambivalent sexism treats different women differently. Unfortunately, this goes to much darker places than just which women get seen as funny but unfeminine. As you'd expect, and was illustrated rather crudely by Hitchens, systems of ambivalent sexism tend to affect those who are not straight differently. Bisexual and lesbian women are more likely to be targets of hostile sexism due to their deviation from traditional gender and sexual norms. Unsurprisingly, homophobia and sexism tend to correlate. Both men and women higher in hostile sexism were higher in homophobia, according to a study by Nagoshi et al., Interestingly, benevolent sexism was also predictive of homophobia, especially in women. Basically, since ambivalent sexism is a system of push and pull that seeks to keep people confined in both sexuality and gender roles, it makes sense that it is bad for gay people, not that it is good for anyone at all. Cowie, Greaves, and Sibley did find that gay, lesbian, and bisexual people were typically lower in both hostile and benevolent sexism. Although, across orientations, men were higher in hostile sexism. They also found gay men had the lowest levels of benevolent sexism, with bisexual men scoring between gay and heterosexual men. Heterosexual women were higher in benevolent sexism than lesbian and bisexual women. 
This backs up the idea that heterosexual intimacy helps to sustain benevolent sexism. Also, it perhaps suggests that women would be more likely to endorse benevolent sexism if they see it as potentially benefiting them. Lesbian and bisexual women may see the possibility of fitting in with a benevolently sexist ideal of womanhood as more unattainable, although of course, in reality, it is unattainable for everyone. Unsurprisingly, ambivalent sexism is also pretty awful for trans people. Transphobia correlates to hostile sexism, and benevolent sexism is also predictive of transphobia, especially in women. Blumel, Humor, and Sternadori conducted an analysis of internet comments regarding which public bathrooms transgender people should be allowed to use. Honestly, that sounds like a really awful set of internet comments to have to sift through. My hat goes off to them. Did I mention that they analyzed almost 10,000 of these comments? Anyway, they found that comments critical of trans bathroom access were more likely to be benevolently sexist. These comments focused on themes like women need protection by men and from men. This is the sort of pointless protective attitude that is not actually protective from any real danger women commonly experience that I was talking about earlier. It is also unfortunately reminiscent of various bigoted actions taken against minorities in the name of protecting women. In case anyone cares about my two cents on this, yes, of course, transgender people should get to use the bathrooms of their gender identity, but I also think that gendered bathrooms are kind of dumb and inefficient anyway. The experience of sexism can also differ along racial lines. For example, a study by McMahon and Kahn found that people expressed more benevolent sexism to white females than black females when given no other information besides race. When information was given regarding how chaste the hypothetical women were, this had much greater effects on the perception of black women, as in being seen as chaste increased the BS directed towards black women much more than it did towards white women. To quote the study, given that BS ideals of purity and defenselessness are incompatible with stereotypes of black women as promiscuous and aggressive, we maintain that this finding is indicative of shifting standards, whereby individuals who exceed the lower expectations of their stereotyped group receive more praise, non-zero sum rewards, for their stereotype inconsistent behavior. It is because expectations for black women's behavior were more negative that participants tended to report that black target should be cherished and protected and set on a pedestal by her man when she surpassed them by being chaste, even more so than her white counterpart. While subjectively positive, this reveals the impact of negative stereotypes and only reinforces her subordinate status relative to men. So yeah, who gets what form of sexism in what situation can be dependent on a lot of factors like race, sexual orientation, transness, and perceived chastity. Understanding the ambivalent nature of sexism is key to understanding why different women have different experiences of sexism. In addition, those that experience primarily benevolent sexism because of a combination of their background and behavior may have more difficulty recognizing how sexist the world is. While strides are being made to conceptualize a wider variety of experiences within the framework of ambivalent sexism, more needs to be done to address the ways that it affects women from marginalized groups. I also think that it is essential for more research to be done on the effects of ambivalent sexism on non-binary people and even on men. Why men, you might ask? Well, both hostile sexism and benevolent sexism are built on gendered expectations for how everyone should act and how they should interact with each other. Men, like women, should be free to inhabit the roles in life that best fit them, not the ones arbitrarily assigned to their gender. Ambivalent sexism includes a systematic undervaluing of feminine traits, especially when those stereotypically feminine traits are exhibited by men. I, for one, don't want to live in a world that punishes instead of rewarding men for being kind and warm, and I would hope most men don't either. The point I want to drive home here is that both benevolent sexism and hostile sexism limit people's freedom. Benevolent sexism is not a valuable reward for compliance. It is simply, to quote Rosa Luxemburg out of context, the promise that those who do not move do not notice their chains. I got that quote off a tea towel belonging to my boyfriend's parents. Unfortunately, I realized this was the perfect quote before I realized all I've read of hers is the tea towel. 
I should get around to reading more of her work. Maybe a whole set of table linens. Anyway, back on topic, I want to live in a world without benevolent sexism and without hostile sexism. Not a world where men and women have to be the same, but one where the standards they are expected to live up to are just and not gendered. In truth, this is all about the freedom to be your best self and make your own choices, and not have that be defined by gender. Understanding that not all sexism comes from hatred is key to achieving this freedom because benevolent sexism can be hard to notice. Now that you know about it, you'll probably notice it more. Sorry if that ends up being annoying, but you can't tear down a system you can only see half of. Thanks so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell. Uh, I'm serious about the bell. A lot of the time YouTube doesn't let you know about new content, especially from small creators, unless you hit the bell. You can check out my social media here. And do you have a question about political psychology? Uh, it could become one of my future videos. So just comment it below or send it to me on social media. It's not going to be the next video though, because by popular demand, the next video is going to be about differing sexual preferences across the political spectrum. So that ought to be a really fun one. I'm really looking forward to getting going on making that.